my boys, we all made it back home. Even the people who live in Chicago. Yeah, I made it back to my parents' house where I belong. <laughs> in the basement where you belong. Just in time to get grounded for being gone all weekend without calling home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, did you check in? You know what? I So Friday night during Grum Gully, while I'm my face is melting on the dance floor, I remembered that uh, I needed to remind my dad to feed my cat. <laughs> <laughs> So that was basically the one time I checked in. I didn't go to the party, but I, I saw some photos of uh, of you guys getting getting up front and and doing a lot of uh, a lot of partying. Yeah, we were undulating. We were we were front stage right. We were dancing. It was fun. I don't even know anything about EDM or whatever that music was, and those people seemed pretty good. Both Grum and Gully seemed seemed pretty good. I mean, I liked it. And the and the third person who was not clearly not allowed to touch the knobs. <laughs> Tried to touch the knobs a couple of times. Shoot away by both Grum and Gully, whoever the third person was. Yeah, I've never been around that many magic people uh, enjoying themselves. <laughs> What's know, that supposed to be? Because the, the tournament environment is generally magic people not enjoying themselves. Exactly. It was a nice contrast. So we we made it home. I, I have one thing to say, though, about this weekend for me. Balatro? Love that Joker. <laughs> Love that Joker. <laughs> More on that in the wind down that we won't have time for this week. Yeah, we'll make time. Hello and welcome to episode 264 of the Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast focused on the latest decks, trends, and strategies for the casual spike. My name is Stanislav here in Chicago. And with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's the one and only Shane Beeps. Stanislav, my friend, it was so good to see you in real life, face to face. It had been over a year. I didn't see you in the entire can- calendar year of 2023, I don't think. Wild. Just wild. But, you know, got to hang out. It was a blast. Got to got to meet Doom in IRL. It was a, it was a, it was a lovely weekend. Shane said that I'm much taller in person than he thought I was. Oh, you're a mountain of a man. You're, you are tall. Haystack how, Calhoun. How tall are you? Seven, two? No, <laughs> come on. Like six, one, maybe. Titan. A titan of magic. Six, six, one. Maybe six, Dan, seven. how tall are you? I thought I was six, two. Uh-huh. And, mm-hmm. and I thought Devin may have been taller than me, even. I thought you were about mm-hmm. the same. It was his overall presence and charisma. Yeah, Devin rizzed us up. <laughs> <laughs> they do call me the Riz God. They do? <laughs> no, they don't. Oh. Okay. Nice t-shirt, Devin, by the way. Thank you. Repping. Always rep heavy play. Every time. Yeah. Randy sent me like 10 of them, so. <laughs> Just rotate through them. Your entire wardrobe is heavy play. That's Devin O'Donnell, a.k.a. Doomwake, on the heavy play on the blues. The blues. That is me. We tried to give you a performance review, but everything was fine. So there is not much review to perform. Well, you also tried to give me a performance review after I was already five beers deep. So, I mean, <laughs> that, that might have been on purpose. <laughs> That's how all of mine have been. <laughs> Yeah, all of David's performance reviews, Harbarger, the Godfather, have been quite poor. So we didn't even bother to give him one this year because it was just going to be more bad news. Improvement required. You guys put me on a pip. Performance improvement plan. Yeah, Harbarger. I got pipped. Speaking of things that Dave Pip Harbarger <laughs> that don't need performance improvement plans, it's heavy play. We we might have just mentioned them. Car gaming accessories brand. Yeah, if you're on a pip to improve your gameplay and your game day, maybe yes. you should grab some heavy play because it will do those things. So yeah, heavy play was at MagicCon Chicago, and people were into it. They moved a lot of product. They basically were selling out of stuff by day three. And you know, we, went by the, we went by the booth. We uh, talked to Randy and the other folks uh, from Heavy Play. And yeah, when, as soon as people see this stuff in real life, uh, they are very into it because you get the snip snap, the snip snap, uh, enhanced ergonomics, enhanced mobility, enhanced protection, the equipment system that allows you to snip snap. Uh, attach, bundle, and carry ABCs. Get to carry all that stuff in a single hand. I did do the carry stuff in a single hand. I ha- I got the repair again because, like, you know, for these side events, they sit you down and they're basically just getting everyone in the same room or in the same area. And you think you're going to play the person across from you. And they're like, no, 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 no. You're going somewhere else, my friend. So yeah, just grab my stuff. Snap it there. Get going. You know what my favorite move of the weekend was with the play mat? What's that? Open the play mat. Yeah. You have the short flap on your right hand side. Yes, as one does. You take the dice dice box, you dock it to the short 
short flap on the top, and then you can snip snap open the drawer on the inside, and your dice box won't go flying around all over the place. It's not an awkward place. It's not in a weird place. It's exactly where it should be. That's perfect. Yeah, because I, uh, you're left-handed. Mm-hmm. I draw with my left hand. And so my the upper right portion is very clear for the dice box. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Stan's Hold mind on. is blown right now. Drawing with my right hand is the most awkward thing I can possibly imagine. First of all, I did not know David was left-handed. Oh, you didn't know that? Had no idea. He's yeah. one of those creative types. Lefty. Sinister. Lefty. That's you wild. Wanna, you want to have your mind blown even more? I play guitar right-handed and always have. Switch hitter. Uh, now Shane is right-handed but draws with his left? Yeah, it just feels better to hold. What do you mean by draw? The, like drawing cards off your drawing, library? Yeah, draw, yeah, draw cards. Okay. I, do, I do not. I do not okay. sketch with my left hand. That would be that would be cool. That'd be just be ambidextrous, my friend. Yeah. But okay, so yeah, the stuff is good. Everyone liked it. It was great. Uh, if you want to go to heavyplay.com, you can use our code the dive down twenty twenty four for ten percent off of your first order. Those new purples, by the way, mm. chef's kiss, stunning. Yeah, I, I I picked up a purple of the one hundred size and also the nice dice box felt good beautiful stan do you want me to talk about this week's show because i feel like i might i think i did kind of the first two parts so i'll just talk about those are going to be yeah and then i'll describe the third part yeah let's 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 do a tag team sweet okay so this week's show we're going to talk about pro tour chicago magic con or more like magic con chicago with the side dish of pro tour chicago aka pro tour murders at karlov manor uh we were all there we all, I think, had a pretty good time. We will talk about the results of the PT itself and maybe some experiences we had inside events and hanging out and stuff like that. We're also going to talk about the preview panel that at least Dave and I attended. Uh, I think Stan showed up t- more towards the end. At four upcoming sets were discussed, were revealed, concepts, mechanics, things like that. So a few preview cards were shown to us. We'll talk about all those things. Then... Stan is going to talk about the breakout deck of the weekend, perhaps, in Rakdos Vampires, his experiences playing it. I think you were also, yeah, Devin, Devin, you were also playing this, right? Yeah, yep, so played a little bit yesterday. You two can have a little chit chat about how you feel this, uh, this deck is positioned, what you like about it, all that good stuff. Anything I'm forgetting? We have interviews. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, if, if you are the kind of person who just listens to the intro and then turns off the episode that kind of listener, you should probably stick around for at least the uh, preview set portion because we have about a you know, 15, 20 minute interview with Blake Rasmussen and Roy Graham. Roy is senior story lead from Wizards of the Coast. We talked to them directly after that preview panel. We asked them things about Monitor Horizons 3, Universes Beyond, overall kind of mechanic and creative direction, all that kind of good stuff. So stay tuned for that. We, we flexed. We used our media credentials to get a scheduled interview with those folks. So that was pretty fun. But before that, we've got some housekeeping. Some new patrons have joined the Dive Down Nation. I think we've met at least one of them. That's right. Shout out to Omar, D, and Kip. Welcome. Thank you for your support. We also have an increased tier from Joe S. Thanks, Joe. I think Joe, I think Joe S. was the, one of the one of the crew this weekend. Yes, I think it, that's that was Joe S. It's that Joe S. That's right. Love it. I love that yeah, for Joe, Joe S. S. Joe S. Great guy. Nice to meet you, Joe. And we got some new reviews. Thanks for getting the weight reference, DZ. That was our comment on Spotify. They 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 understood that reference and were upset that they understood it because it made them feel old. Mm-hmm. That's me too. Feeling old, Dave? I mean, if I'm making jokes about the band, then yes, I'm always feeling old. If you'd like to support the show with your hard-earned money, you can do that at patreon.com slash the dive down. We know you work hard for the money, and we work hard for the podcast. If you support us at as little as a dollar a week, that gets you into the Discord, where we organize things like MC Chicago after parties, or we had a, a modern win up. Was it a win a box? A, a modern. It was. It was more of a split a box. You effectively won parts of a box. You know, we, just, we just put packs. We had an eight person pod and put packs on each match. It was fun. Yeah, yeah. And we organized it in the Discord, and that's where to do that. Things like that when we are out and about, or just chat with us. All other three hundred sixty five days of the year. Patreon dot com slash the dive down. We also have merch. We have swag. We introduced a new piece of swag at MagicCon. Soon you'll get to see it as well on the dive.com slash store. Yeah. That's our web store. 
where we sell stuff. We have e-commerce. It's an e-store. Mm-hmm. 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 I wore my new hat this weekend. That's a nice hat. It's really nice. They are nice. Maybe you want to support us while you play Magic. Magic Online, especially. You can do that with <laughs> Mana Traders with promo code the dive down underscore 3 y o through the end of February and maybe the first day or two of March. Uh, we'll have a new code in the show notes. Yeah, just always check the show notes. But if you're hearing this in February, somehow, some way, earlier than it's supposed to be released. Or wait, is, is this a leap year? Are we coming out on the 29th this year? Oh my goodness. So maybe you will hear this in February if you're a day one listener. The dive down underscore three YO. 10% off first three months of Mana Traders. Okay, PT Chicago. We got there. Mm. We actually did get there. Wow. <laughs> we literally did get there. Yeah. Yes, we got there. Yeah, Magic Con Chicago was great. Um, you know, like we said, we got the meet we got to meet up all together for the first time in quite some time. We had new host Devin in the fold. We had a bunch of listeners, uh, a bunch of people that we got to meet. Just like you know, people it was funny, like Dave and I were sitting uh at the on the last day just watching the, the finals of the Pro Tour on like the big screen. And someone came up to us and was just like, Yeah, like I, I know I know your all's voice. Like you're from the dive down, and I was like, "What? That's wild!" From across the hall, they heard us. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. You know, we met tons of people. People asked us to sign Rhino tokens. People asked us to sign copies of Dive Down. People were quoting Dave's embarrassing miscommunications from like old episodes <laughs> back to him. Yeah, Cameron, if you're out there, Thomas, if you're out there, thanks I have for the learned cube. from my mistakes. Yeah, and thanks for the cube. It's true. Yeah, it was great. So, I mean, we, we could talk about that for an hour and a half on its own. But, yeah. you know, I don't know if people tune in for the personal stories, perhaps. But I definitely think um, as a result of this weekend, we will certainly keep our eyes out if we can go to more of these events and hang out. I, I thought that for what it's worth, like the environment of the Magic Con was really fun. Um, I know that, like usual, events had problems firing. They had problems going too long. Rounds went too long. All those things. We had noise problems from oh, yeah. huge events on the main stage, blowing up people's games during the standard open, Devin and others. I, I think all in, though, it was pretty cool. And I, I liked being at a big version of a con that was all magic. Like One of the things that we yeah. liked about DreamHack was the fact that it was kind of like other stuff going on to do. There were other programs and other things. And this one felt like it was all just one for us. And I, I really enjoyed that. For sure. Yeah, it was, it was a blast. It was, it was uh, well spaced out. I, I really liked the fact, I mean, I'm just going to talk for a bit about what I liked. It was easy. It was actually easy to find open tables. Like, you, you know, you just had to know where they were, right? Like they were in the back, but they had space for people to post up and play. Like we never really had a hard time. Like, you know, at smaller events, that's like, where do I even sit down to play one match? Like one match against one person. But here we could you know, sit like, you know, with eight, 10 people and just do a cube draft or have our eight person modern pod and, pod and stuff like that. And I thought overall, uh, everything ran pretty darn smoothly for me, but I also did not play a lot of side events. I sold a bunch of magic cards and yeah. then i bought a bunch of other magic cards so the vendors the vendors were good at this magic con there was 50 of them so that that helped davin what was your favorite part what was what was my favorite part <laughs> what was your favorite part davin <laughs> my favorite part um i don't know i mean kind of just a little bit of everything i i uh i guess the 75k was that was the event that i played the most in I played that on saturday or friday and saturday like Dave was mentioning, the, the noise was a bit awkward on the first day, but day two wasn't too bad. Um, yeah, just like, you know, reiterating everything you guys said, there's a lot of open space and uh, I got to play some side events, got to sell some cards, did a bunch of stuff. It was uh, it was amazing time. Devin, what's the verdict on the deep dish situation? Lou Malnati's. I would, I would go you again. Seem, you, you, you seem like you liked it. I would go again. You took care of that pizza. Oh, I took yeah. care of mine. It was delicious. Oh, yeah. That garlic bread was good. Can we talk about the Pro Tour, my friends? Okay, we got to talk about the Pro Tour because it was I almost guess. like all weekend we were forgetting that the Pro Tour was Pioneer, one of the formats that we keep an eye on. <laughs> they, they made it easy to forget. Yeah. Like it, it was held at Magic on Chicago uh, and we were uh, all there to compete, of course. And what really happened, it was like sort of it took place like in a separate atrium. Like, like right outside the main hall was like this nice, you know, carpeted, uh, spacious atrium where the Pro Tour people got to hang out. I think they had like their own lounge and stuff like that. But besides that, it did take place uh, on Friday and Saturday. 
Top eight was on Sunday. Three rounds of MKM draft, five rounds of Pioneer constructed each day. There were 257 players, a lot of names you've probably heard. I'm going to give you a list of people that I recognize in the top 50. If you're not on this list and you think you're you're good at magic, forgive me. I'm only one person. Sam Party, Jan Emanuel Depras, Seth Manfield, Simon Nielsen, Javier Dominguez, Eli Cassis, Marcio Carvalho, Shota Yasioka, Logan Nettles, Reed Duke, Ben Stark, Matt Sperling, Samuel Estrati, Marco Del Pivo, all appearing in just the top 50. I do not want to play in this event. The Pro Tour is back, baby. I will lose. I was going to say, I would learn so much, but I would lose so hard. Yeah, I mean, just play it out. Just go like, you know... To 210. I think people mostly should play it out when they're in the Pro Tour. I don't know what you guys think. Oh, yeah. But mostly people should play it out when they're in the Pro Tour. I mean, especially if it's, kicks. especially if it's, you know, your first one, you're, you're basically your first one, right? You want to make sure that you're playing each of those rounds to get a feel for not just the, the caliber opponent that you're playing against, but also just to learn the structure of it, you know, and how different it is than playing your local FNM. And also, when it's the last round and you're not sure if your opponent needs the point match points or not, you should just play it out, mm. right? <laughs> All right. Good anyway. one. Good one. I like that. <laughs> Had to drop that one in there. Our Twitter drama of the week. Yeah. We could spend all next week's episode talking about that. Sure. Um, I won't be on that one. I've got a vacation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the overall constructed metagame. We had 17.8% of the field on Is It? We had 14 on Azorius Control. We had 14 on Rakdos Midrange. So the, the holy trinity of Pioneer right now is it Phoenix, Azorius Control, Rakdos Midrange. Maybe not for long. We will talk about that later. I mean, I'll just say what I've said to people a lot over the weekend and when you guys heard me say, I was surprised that is it surpassed Azorius Control ultimately in, in the decks that were registered here. It wasn't by that much, but you know, I still thought that Blue white control was going to be the top deck, and that is it would be second, and then we kind of go from there. But oh yeah, I do not disagree. Um, and I think we'll talk about what ended up being perhaps good choices, not so good choices, as we get into kind of the performances of the decks. But up next, we had Lotus Field combo making a bit of a comeback here. Eight point nine percent of the metagame, twenty three players, and then following that was per to me the biggest surprise. We had six point six percent of the field on Amalia combo a deck that I kind of assumed was sort of uh, not doing so well. I kind of assumed that people were kind of off it, but it uh, spoilers, it did pretty well this weekend. And 6.6% of the room was perhaps justified in their choice. And then we have some fun stuff. We've got Boros Heroic at 4.7. We've got Is It in Soul at 4.3. Boros Convoke at 4.3. And Rakdos Vampires at 4.3. So a, a bunch of fun decks in the, uh, let's say, tier three in terms of representation, perhaps, but not in our hearts or in performance. Yeah. I mean, definitely when people saw this meta breakdown, they went, mm -hmm. Rakdos what? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Everybody instantly bought Sorens and Vein Rippers. Yeah. <laughs> Except for me, I'm, even though I was about to buy them and I chose not to, which was not a good decision. <laughs> I mean, there was about a day or half a day where we didn't know. Yeah. Right. Like, didn't this metagame breakdown come out on Thursday? It did. Yeah. And then we were kind of like, what in the world is Rakdos Vampires? What does that mean? And who brought it? Because it felt like one of those things that a team brought since it was a deck name nobody was familiar with. And we'll get into that a lot more mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, and then the last two decks that are before the other category are Jeskai Creativity at 3.1 and Niv to Light at 2.7. I know, yeah, I know Niv did get some tools recently, but. You know, seven brave souls, perhaps, on Niftalite. So, and then other was 15.5, everything below 2.7. So that's a pretty top-heavy metagame. 15.5% other is not very much. 3% is usually our other cutoff. So, you know, pretty top-heavy. Uh, popular decks, though, in the other category were things like 5 Raksak, 4 Grease Fang, 4 Omnath to Light, 4 Enigmatic Fires, and then, uh, you know, special shout-out to the one player on Vanifar Combo. Way to go. I saw that deck list. I don't know. I don't know if you saw it, Dave, but it looked wild. It was a lot of. Did it? I didn't get to see the actual list. I just assumed that it was the list of my dreams. But maybe I should take a look and see what it is. I think it had like one thought Nazi or something. There, there was some Ooh, strange numbers. Here? Yeah, oh, yeah. You should check it out. Okay, you just I'll gotta, have to look that you go up. Go up the chain. Up the chain. You find a thought Nazi along the way. That's very funny. Thought Nazi a sweet card. Always sweet. I wish it was still. I wish it was still playable. I think that was that was like a well designed card. Uh, so is it Phoenix? The deck of choice for 
most players. You know, the tried and true high performer, I think ostensibly people thought it would perform well against the other most popular decks in Rakdos Mid and Azorius Control. Like, of course, Phoenix might have to deal with like a no more lies if they're hard casting Phoenix is or something like that, but that's not like a major risk that we're concerned about, I don't think. Uh, most of the decks that I saw looked pretty stock to me. I saw a few players running two Ashiok Dream Render which I think would be good against decks like Amalia, decks like the Mirror. If you can you know, clear out their graveyard main deck, it can power out your own graveyard. So I think it's a it's a pretty um, fun inclusion. Have you ever played Ashiok in your Is It Phoenix decks? I know you're, you're an Is It Phoenix lover, Devin. Or, and I, Dave. I haven't personally. I, I actually saw some of the, I think some of the PT lists had a main deck. Yeah. Yes, they had, yeah, they had yeah. a two, two main deck. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, pre-boarding, right? Like I... I've never tried that, Stan. I don't think you've ever tried that, but I no. The list that I yeah, the list that I grabbed over the weekend definitely had two in the sideboard. Yeah, it's one of those things. I think like you know because you have so much ability to get through your deck, like and in a pro tour meta, you're like, well, I wish I could play seventy eight cards, and you know sometimes pre boarding gets you there. You yeah, the side out stuff. Phoenix performed really well. It had a fifty seven point five win rate against. 204 matches, 74% against Rakdos mid, and 70% I guess against Azorius control. So Wowie. it did it did the thing. It it did well against the predicted metagame, perhaps, but it did have the expected low 31% against Lotus Field, 41% against Amalia, and 43 against Heroic. So that's where it kind of lost some matches, but still being 57.5 across the whole event, pretty darn good. Yeah, that's interesting. The other thing I'll note is when you look at Frank Carson's chart here, Phoenix actually has uh, the highest bottom end of its confidence interval. So if you think like, okay, what was the deck that had the best kind of like worst case scenario? Phoenix was it. Yeah, just because it had such a big sample size and, yeah. and the good win rate. So C- can you explain just in, in two sentences, like uh, what does confidence interval mean in terms of this type of data? And how, how do we use it to understand whether data especially deck win percentages are reliable. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what confidence interval is, right? It's trying to, it's using mathematics to describe how much confidence you should have in the number that you see in the win rate that's there. And that's a function of the number of matches that it has basically. So it's, it's trying to include something that explains the sample size in the, the data that you're looking at there. So the ones that have really big confidence intervals where it's like, we're not sure if the, da- it, so the win rate was X and it, it ranged, the confidence interval ranged from Y to Z. You know, a big one of those is because it's small sample size and a small one of those is because it's a tight, uh, it's a large sample size of matches. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Azorius Control, second place, perhaps unsurprising. Um, High-level players love their agency, they love them counter spells. But it performed somewhat below average, 47.2%, probably mostly due to the poor Phoenix matchup and the scale of Phoenix that was at the event. According to Frank, the these decks were split basically evenly between 80-card and 60-card versions. I'm assuming the 80-card versions were also running Yorian, they weren't just kind of padding their deck total. Rakdos mid up next. Apparently a horrible choice this weekend. Uh, 41.7% win rate across 228 matches. It got eaten alive by Is It Phoenix, by Amalia combo. And uh, only 46% against control. Uh, the Inti deck, in, like the decks with Inti appeared to be less in favor than kind of the maybe more traditional larger builds. I didn't see a lot of Inti in the decks that I was looking at uh, hmm. in the, t- the tops of the list. Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw Nassif. You guys saw Nassif's tweet before, it's like after they announced the metagame percentages, he was like, I think it was like, you know, the 14 people, 14% are registered Rakdos. He was like, yeah, it's really unfortunate that 14% of you guys just chose not to try or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> chose up. Chose to show up without a deck without or something. A de- yeah, like, something like that. He said. Yeah. yeah. Woof. Brutal. Uh, Lotus Field combo also did below average, however, at 46.1%. It really was leaning hard on like the strong matchup versus versus Is a Phoenix and also 50% versus control to get to that slightly underwhelming 46.1. It, it was really a dog to like Rakdos mid range and the creature decks. The most interesting kind of development that we talked about last week was Archdruid's Charm, um, and now it's more or less stock. In 22 of the 23 decks, it was a quartet. You know, it tutors up a needed land. Uh, it's it's the only, Frank said, is the only like three mana version of that effect 
um, that's been printed. So that is you know a good reason, especially because your land makes three mana of one color. Yeah, funny Correct. funny enough, the only person who didn't play Archdruid's Charm was Sean Goddard, beekeeper on MTGO, and he got 19th. He was the, the third highest finishing Lotus Field player. So even without the charms, he still did pretty good. Yeah, for sure. Like I, I think it's probably helpful helpful for me because I don't need I don't need to uh, be good. I just need to draw the right cards at the right time. Um, you know, it can get a. What's interesting is it can't doesn't only get a land. It can get like a silver bullet creature. It can take out a hate piece via like the disenchant mode. I'm, I don't think it's casting the second mode very often at all, but you never know. But yeah, Lotus Field combo below average. Um, Amalia combo was a apparently strong choice this weekend. It had a fifty five point nine percent win rate. It was strong against all the top decks besides Control, where it was a 43%, perhaps unsurprising. And a few of the high-performing decks appear to be running three Fauna Shaman to tutor up needed creatures. What That's one in the green for some stat line that doesn't matter, and it can tap, pay green, and discard a creature from your hand to tutor up a creature. Is that how it works? That is right. Perfect. Let's talk about that build for a quick second because uh, I was I'm looking at Frank's Twitter replies here on this thread, and there's a little conversation here between Ellie Cassis and Frank, where Ooh. Ellie says, "Can we get a different subheading for Fauna Shaman Amalia?" Oh, come on! And Frank says, <laughs> "Team Handshake was the only one to include Amal- that card in Amalia combo. What makes Fauna Shaman so special, and how did you settle on that card choice?" So I guess Ellie was on uh, Team Handshake, and then Frank says. Uh, that those decks went 17 and 7 for a 71% win rate. Ooh, nice. I mean, Team Handshake's playing it. So, True. you know, pr- proverbial hand sandwich. Ham you know what sandwich. that means. Yeah. Ham Sammy. Let's talk about Amalia for a second in the lead up to the Pro Tour, because I think for a while we've considered it was definitely on the downswing after the RC, which was its kind of big break weekend. And I think one of the things we learned from the RC in Atlanta was that it was pretty good against Phoenix, especially with the that white card. Like, I, it's not Return to the Ranks. I mean, that is a white it card. It is Return to the Ranks. Is it, it is Return, Return to the Ranks? ranks. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. that white card, it is Return to the Ranks. <laughs> the one you thought it was. Yes. It was a really great tool against the Phoenix decks in particular. And yet, it's been struggling. Even in this very Phoenix-dominated metagame, comes back in the Pro Tour and kind of shows that it can actually keep up with the deck. Why do we think it's been in such a poor position up until now? And what is it about these big tournaments that seems to allow this deck to actually kind of shine? Because people like me play it versus people like Pro Tour players. Like, I think, I mean, when, when, you're, when you're running a version with, like, fewer Cocos, like the Handshake version only had two Cocos instead of four, and, you know, three Fauna Shaman, like, a deck like that, I think, plays more slowly. You know, it's it's definitely a slower version of doing the same thing. I think it's like they know how to when to deploy the thing, when to try to go for the thing, how to, you know, Dave and I, when we were watching the finals together and anyone who watched this as well, we watched a game where uh, a Amalia player kept a hand versus an aggressive deck that was literally just like two wild growth walkers and a, a trigger, like an explore trigger. And just basically rode that to victory, just gaining life, um, putting up impossible roadblocks. And those are the kind of things like I would potentially think about. But I think those are the kind of things that make d- distinguish people, you know, players like me just picking up a deck, maybe taking it to the FNM or something like that, versus I think players who really know how to get every edge with it. And of course, it just really is a powerful strategy. And it does something that no other deck in the format can do. And, and that is go to turn seven. Go to game, seven. Game, best seven of five best of five. game seven and best of five match. Yeah, <laughs> that exactly. was awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's a perfect storm for that, right? Because the heroic deck has the pump spells. Yeah. So if you pump it to tw- if you pump it past 20, never hits 20. Well, not, go into not, a draw. not just the pump spells, also the indestructible spells. Yeah, oh, yes, the indestructible Samuel's spells. Samuel's playing four Lorenz escapes. You can just Lorenz escape the Wild Growth Walker and it never stops. Yeah, just kind of cool. Exactly. One other thing that I will mention about why Amalia has maybe been doing a little bit more poor on like the Magic Online results, 
Uh, as we talked about since the RC, I mean, we the, the talk of the town at the RC was blue white control, right? That was the best performing deck. It was the deck that won the tournament, all that stuff. And Amalia has a pretty horrendous blue white control matchup. And I think a lot of the reason why we kind of wrote off Amalia going up to the PT is because we all thought that blue white control was going to be the most played deck. And it turns out, you know, it was still it was still relatively decently played. It was, this, you know, one it was it was up there for sure, but not nearly as much as Phoenix. And I think the Amalia deck does have a pretty good Phoenix matchup, or at least you can you can build your deck to have a good Phoenix matchup. A, ca- a card that I saw to me makes one of its first appearances in the sideboard were some Tamiyo safekeeping. You know, hyper efficient, indestructible. Uh, was it, does it give hexproof too, or just indestructible? I forget. I think it's hexproof too. And you know, so that's a, a nice, efficient way to protect your creatures from sweepers and things like that. It still doesn't stop, of course, lockdown. But what are you going to do? But yeah, I think uh, I mean I don't have the answer, of course, Dan. Long story short, but I think you know it's it's a good deck that can be you know piloted well by people prepping for a pro tour for sure. So Boris I, mean, I Baruch, think oh, I ahead. think Ellie Cassis would say that it was Fauna Shaman that made it work because seventeen and seven means that the non Fauna Shaman decks went fifty nine and fifty three, so they were much close. It was much closer to a just barely positive deck. Mm. I did steal a Fauna Shaman from you, Dave, so I got yes. two more to go yep. to never play this deck in paper. <laughs> yep. One last small shout out. Shout out to the Painful Truths in, uh, in Larson Cyborg. There's one Painful Truths. That's all I yeah. can say. That's Love funny. It. Love it. Boros Heroic, the deck of choice for Dave and Devin this weekend, I believe, did well at 53.7. You know, it did have a smaller sample size of 82 matches, and it wasn't amazing against Rakdos mid, perhaps unsurprising, 34%, but it was 50 plus percent against everything else, especially, you know, a clean 7 0 against Lotus Field. It must have just been too fast for that kind of strategy to keep down. How did you like playing Heroic this weekend? I know Devin, you did a side event with it. Dave, did you did you get in there with Heroic in any actual any actual event? I played it in the Pioneer Cup on Friday night. How was that? How'd you like it? Uh, I mean, it felt like a real deck to me. I um, I lost to Raxac, and that was pretty tough. That felt like kind of unwinnable because they just had so much stuff that got in the way of my cards, and also could basically kill stuff whenever I want, they wanted to. And if they get the, you know, if they get the Devil online, it wasn't particularly good. So that felt like a pretty tough matchup. Um, but I it felt like a real deck to me. Yeah, I was a, a very big fan of it. I played a, just a you know constructed win a box, and I ended up winning the win win the win of box, which let me win a win a box and uh, words. So I hadn't played the heroic deck since the introduction of monstrous rage, and that honestly was kind of the biggest thing for me. Like that card was just completely insane. Just yes. being able to like double prowess trigger, give your thing plus three and trample. Uh, it just like you know, allows you to fight through chump blockers pretty effectively. I did play the Fugitive Codebreakers. I played three of them and never really was in a position to morph it or I guess disguise it and flip it face up. But I mean, just having like another two, two mana, two, one prowess ace was fine. So um, don't know how, how impactful that card is. Simon Nielsen, who actually lost in the finals of the Pro Tour, had uh, zero copies of Codebreaker in his deck list. So yeah, I mean, I like that card. I I did get to like Wombo Combo with Fusion of Codebreaker, where I had it on disguise. I was playing against Blue White Control. I was a I played an extra threat into the board because they were like getting out ahead and stuff, and I wanted them to wrath. And then they wrath, and in response, you know, I was hell bent, and I got to flip the um, flip my guy at instant speed and draw three cards, and that felt pretty good against a against a wrath, you know. So so I got to do it one time. It felt reasonable. It's definitely the best two drop that any of those types of decks has seen other than questing Druid and Modern, you know, so. Oh, yeah. And we're not playing that here, so. Love the deck, though. I'd play it again. Yeah, it looked like a blast. I I, uh, I watched you play one match in one of your side events, and it looked really good. I also liked watching Devin play because we had never, we had not played, we, we still didn't get a single uh, match in in real life we were we were trying to get one in before your eight, eight and person fired. pod fired yeah. and it fired immediately <laughs> and i was like oh no oh, devin plays like a real magic player what is, what is that his, supposed his to hands be? they move his hands move so so precisely so smooth. these cards are tapped at such a such an angle so smooth the, so smooth 
Uh, and Soul was 45.6%. It's best matchup, 5-3 against Lotus Field, small sample size. Uh, I did notice only four of 11 players were using the new... I, I mean, didn't notice that. Frank told me. Four of the 11 players were using the new Gleaming Gear Drake or Case of the Filched Falcon from Murderers. But yeah, and Soul didn't blow the doors off here. Stan, have you played it since we talked about it last? Yeah, I played it at the Pioneer Cup oh, yeah, on Pioneer Friday Cup. night and started strong, ended week. It was not my best showing, but it was also my first time playing in Soul's current version in paper. So I still might keep an eye on it as we warm up into Pioneer RCQ season in a month or two. Yeah, it's coming up before before we know it. And now we finally get to the breakout deck of the tournament, Rakdos Vampires. Only 11 pilots on the deck, but it went 59 and 39 for a 60.2% win rate. It had a winning record against all the major players besides Is It Phoenix, but it still was only 50, 48% against that. So a totally adequate showing there, but overall, really darn good. Uh, Stan and Devin are going to talk more about this deck later. We won't get it, into it too much here, but long story short, this deck does feature vampires. Yeah. Vampires. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we should just say, right? It's Soren plus Vayne Ripper. Everybody knows that. Splinter Twin. Kind of. Twin. <laughs> Might as well be. And we'll get, it, we'll get into more about what was, what's good about that card, but it is like basically red-black mid-range where the creatures are kind of shifted towards being vampires to enable Soren plus Vayne Ripper. Like there that's, you go. That's what it is. I will, so if, I, you, if you drop off now, now you know. I will say for the listeners at home, just to give you a rundown of some of the names that played this deck – uh, Seth Manfield, Luis Scott Vargas, Reed Duke, Beth Sperling, Theodore Jung, Jim Davis, Tommy Ashton, Arne Hushenbeth. You may have heard of some of those folks. Yeah, yes, those Sam are Hardy. good. Good players. Good, yeah. good, good players. Can we, before we get to the top eight, can we just give some shout outs to the other decks up here that performed very well in isolation? Can we do like a mini Cool Decks Inc. for a do minute it. here? Because I did think some of these were interesting, mostly because uh, Demir Control had an 80% win rate in the hands of of everybody's favorite, uh, Gabe Nassif. Yeah. Yep. Gabe Nassif, uh, who was on team channel fireball and decided to eschew what his team was doing. That was already breaking the tournament and played De a Demir control deck that like basically nobody has seen before, <laughs> before in pioneer, he played four deduce as part of this. He played three death deadly coverups, which is a card from Karlov manor, uh, and three sensors. This is this is classic Gabe Nassif. Demir Control went eight and two, had the highest record of any of any deck. It looks like, uh, but the other one I wanted to mention is that another person from that team, Ben Stark, also decided not to play the Rakdos list and instead play, went seven and three with Boros Burn, like a deck that we had <laughs> had theorized might be a thing uh, with the inclusion of Lightning Helix in the format now. And this deck kind of looks like you would imagine, except for it's got Kamano Faces, Kakazan, which is a deck I think you would think was in here, along with Eidolon, Bonecrusher Giant, Play With Fire. Uh, the Burn Suite is just Skewer the Critics, Boros Charm, Lightning Helix, and Play With Fire. So it's got, it relies a little more heavily on creatures than some of these lists do sometimes. But um, I thought that was interesting to see somebody do well with it, even if it is a Hall of Famer. Gotta yeah. go fast. One thing about yeah. one thing about Nassif, even if his team told him that they broke the format with like, you know, a red aggressive deck and their win percentage their win percent was ninety percent, he would probably still never even come close to registering it. So Right. It's true. That's just it's him. true. He's he's just there for the vibes. Yes. And to help test, I guess, and then and then do what he wants. Uh Quintorius combo went through. 65% in tw in 20 matches. So I guess maybe two players played that. The only reason I will mention that is because uh, member of the nation, Jason, also known as Kilgore online, also did really well with Quint Combo uh, in the Pioneer Cup, coming in 10th or 12th place before, uh, you know, just barely missing on the top eight with that and was doing great with it. Uh, and then we also saw Just Guy Control do okay with somebody six and four. Uh, that's just Control plus Lightning Helix that we've talked about a couple times. But so there's there's the, the main reason I want to say this before we get to the top eight is like there was a lot of not non meta decks, but the meta was a little different. I think the people thought, especially in the second tier down with this Rakdos Vampires list, is it in soul being higher maybe than people thought Boros Heroic being higher than people thought. And then the top eight and like the decks that did well, I think are all pretty interesting, um, too. Yeah, we've got uh, let's let's run through the top eight. Sam Party, Rakdos Vampires. Alex Friedrichsen, Lotus Field. Adam Edelson, 
is a Phoenix. Jan Emmanuel Depraz on Phoenix. Seth Manfield on Vampires. Simon Nielsen, fourth top eight in a row. Is that correct? Yes. Fourth oh, pro tour top eight, top eight, top eight in a row. Seems okay. Never been done before. Never heard of this person. Even Kai didn't do that? No. no Kai, nope. Nobody else wow. has ever done that. Not Kai, not Finkel. Wow. Uh, this is something Brian uh, Brian David Marshall was talking about on stage as Shane and I watched the coverage, which was great, by the way. It was yeah. um, BDM, Reed Re Duke. Yeah, it was Reed Duke and BDM talking about the court, the semifinals and the finals, and then they were joined by Andrea Mangucci for a large part Could of that as well. They missed his flight because of that, probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Simon Nielsen on Boris Heroic, Christopher Larson on Amalia Combo, and Min Yang Chen on Lotus Field. I would not want to be playing in this top eight, even if I was given the chance. I would just concede. I'd be like, okay. Wouldn't you want to see what they do to you? <laughs> like how bad it is? <laughs> Eat me alive. Uh, and then Seth Manfield ended up taking it all down. Uh, won his second Pro Tour, his first since Pro Tour Exelon in 2017. Hall of Famer. Pretty good at magic. Mm -hmm. I actually briefly talked to Seth. Um, it's funny. Like I was, I was walking around on Friday, and you know, just basically looking for a way to find kind of you know faces, names I knew that weren't in a conversation. I'm not because I'm not going to go up to somebody, interrupt them. And Seth was you know taking a break between rounds. He was he was flying solo. So I walked up to Seth. He kind of he kind of eyed me like what. what? Like how how long are you gonna interview me, interview me for? I was like two minutes, and he had only played one round of constructed. He had gone three zero in his draft with like a simic deck, and he told me he was on the Rakdos Vampires, and it was kind of what was written on the tin. You know, you've got you've got Soren, you've got Vein Ripper, and you've got a mid range deck around that. And I was like, you know, good luck. Hope you make day two. He ends up winning the whole thing. That was pretty fun. Are we gonna are we gonna drop nah, that I don't think, footage I don't think in here? Even, or? I don't think there's even a reason to drop it because really it was like you know, hey, how's it going? Uh, what do you what, what are you playing? And he was like, yeah, it's basically Soren plus Vein Ripper. Vein Ripper is really good. <laughs> and, yeah, so yeah, that's it. You are his good luck charm. Yeah, that, that's how I'm gonna you know I'm gonna I'm gonna send him a, get into those DMs. Be like Seth, I'm glad that I brought you to the to the. Where's finals. my taste? Yeah, Seth. Seth Shane needs to get his beak wet. Where's that, where's that share? Seth. <laughs> Seth. Here's my PayPal address if you want to send me some of your winnings. Yeah. Here's, my, here's my Venmo QR code. All right. Any overall thoughts on the Pro Tour? We don't have to think about it for like two months after this. We do have the RCQ format starting April 20th, running through July 21st. Will we have a set? We'll have a set. I'm sure between. Now and April 20th, right? At least one. <laughs> At least one. <laughs> At least. That's my we'll best thunder. guess. I don't know, man. Well, isn't the next Pro Tour MH3 plus we no. have Thunder Junction before No, then? I think the next PSD is Thunder Junction and then MH3? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, they ganged them up. The Pro Tours are like front-loaded. It's like the first half of the year, really. Yeah. Uh, thunder Junction comes out 19th of April. Ooh. So, yeah, right after that. We, it the really RCC sounds like the sequel to Pineapple Express to me. <laughs> <laughs> the eve of my favorite holiday, indeed. So yeah. you, you, can't even, you can't even really plan for the next, for the RCQ season because we'll have Thunder Junction. But in, in, any, any overall thoughts, feelings about this Pro Tour? I mean, I thought it was incredible. The fact that we kind of, I'm not going to say that we thought that Pioneer was a stale format because there was still some innovations happening and, you know, Blue White Control picked up Normalize and, and things like that, but to see the Rakdos Vampires deck come out and put on as a dominant of a performance as it did win the entire event, um, you know, their win percentage was crazy. The and, and You could tell that there was an entire pro team, well, not an entire, minus uh, Stubborn Gabe Nassif, of course, but almost an entire pro team believed in this deck, and uh, it's it's wild to see that that deck had, you know, such a, a breakout deck like that had such a dominant performance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they broke it. They really, they, they really did, you know, and it was, it was that magic, the way that we used to have on pro tours where it was like, okay, here's a bunch of pros getting together who haven't paid a ton of attention to a format and they're going to go sit in a house ostensibly in Chicago somewhere and they're going to look at the format and they're going to bring something new to it. And it happened. Devin, were there any murmurs of this deck in the MTGO trenches leading up to the MC? Not that I was aware of. I mean, I was I was still keeping tabs in the format, keeping up with results, and I hadn't seen anybody incorporate Soren and Vein Ripper in any of their deck lists, so I didn't think, you know, they, they kept it hush-hush very, very well. 
you know, so I didn't see it like uh, nobody like leaked out and accidentally five would you know, somehow sometimes that happens where like, yeah, they accidentally five. Yeah, yeah, no, but they uh, they kept it hush hush. I didn't see I didn't hear anything about it. Yeah, what's cool, too, is that you know, they finally did it with the Soren plus big stupid vampire. You know, what I mean, like people have tried this a number of times uh, in with various big stupid vampires. And apparently, you know, I'm sure it didn't lead entirely on that because you can't just lean on having the two two card combo the whole pro tour so the rest of the deck was designed to still support getting there or even getting to like hard cast the thing i imagine a few times but you know it's cool that yeah we, they finally did the the splinter twin uh with soren and and it made it work yeah i mean it's interesting to hear reed talk about it on stage too because reed mentioned that like paul rietzel was the person who had put together this package to try to test and they gave him space to try it out. And then they kept iterating from there. And like, that's not a name that I had heard in a minute either. So it's cool to hear like all these (laughs) pros from the before times still have the fire, you know? Yeah. It's rad. But like we said, we were also at the magic con to just experience the magic, not just sort of distantly watch a pro tour. We have these upcoming sets and previews. Dave, you were there with me. Let's let's I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this over to you. So I'm not talking for an hour and a half. Uh, we got four new sets. We did. Yes, we did. I mean, it it was super cool to be at one of these panels. This is probably one of my favorite parts to walk out and see like the slideshow and see the cards come up for the first time that nobody else has seen. And that would shortly go, you know, circulating around twitter as fast as possible you know to just feel feel the in-person yes. enthusiasm of mark yes. rosewater just come good. flying across the entire convention hall yeah I, I i unnecessarily live tweeted it even though magic themselves were live tweeting it you know what <laughs> we got to build clout somehow what if somebody's somehow. following you and not magic the magic official streaming you know? i mean that would be something i would do yes yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it was it was really good, and um, all the people up there were super interesting to hear. Tommy was Blake, Aaron, Roy, and Mark Rosewater, and they just went through the sets and like there was a lot of con- they got through a lot of content in about eighty minutes or ninety minutes in this in this panel. Uh, you know, we talked about four sets. Uh, they they went in reverse chronological order, which I thought was kind of interesting. So they started with the stuff that was farthest away, and then got to the stuff that was closest. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first thing that we previewed was Bloomborough. I'm not sure if we have to talk a ton about this, this set, but this is oh, your, I think it's going to be fun. I mean, it's cute. It's very cute art. Like it's all anthropomorphic. Yeah. No humans. creatures. The second yeah. set since Lorwyn that has no humans. That's right. No humans in this set at all. It's all uh, different animals and it has a guild, a two color guild set up, uh, which we're all very familiar with now. And each animal belongs to a different guild. So it's like the red, white is mice. The blue, green is toads, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is, is it otters? Yes, there there were otter. Well, okay, so Ral Ral yeah. was an otter. So they had they had an anthropomorphic Ral and uh, in a, as an otter, and there was a fox Jace. So yeah. we will, well, there was a fox that was unnamed, but it certainly it was, was wearing, wearing Jace's, Jace's robe. robe. Yes, yeah. Sh- unnamed, we, of course. Sh- sh- shall yeah. we do some called shots and what that means? Some uh, story predictions. You mean what do you mean? He so, comes comes back to life as a fox. So, so either this means that uh, our beloved characters are turning into animals, and other beloved characters are going to have to investigate what's causing this strange animal magic. So what about Jace? Well, Jace and Ral are being turned into animals. Oh no! I, know, I was I was just referring to the beloved characters part. Hilarious. <laughs> This could also mean that they're doing like special showcase versions of our beloved planeswalkers, but in animal form. True. Yeah, it might not be a main main deck. Okay. Although the Ral had a name on it that was yeah. unique, I think. It was like Ral Otter Boy, like yeah. something like that. Ral, I'm an otter now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had bats, badgers, frogs, mice, lizards, rabbits, some other stuff. So that'll be cool. Yeah, I mean, that's fun. They, I didn't think any of the cards were particularly interesting. They only showed a few. You know, they they showed a mouse lord named Mabel, heir to crag flame, uh, a three mana three three that gives other mice plus one plus one and creates a piece of equipment when she ETBs. The, the crag flame uh, is what it is. There's, but the, I think this is you know like anything, it'll be fun. It's it's Redwall, right? People, some people like Redwall. I haven't checked it out yet. I think maybe I'll suggest it to my child when the, the time is appropriate. Uh, next up was Assassin's Creed. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it was up next. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it definitely was. So Assassin's Creed was the weird one. 
right? It's a mini set, essentially. It's 100 cards, 80 new cards, 20 are reprints that are in there. And so it's going to be tiny packs, I think, a la uh, March of the Machines Aftermath. Uh, this set, though, is modern legal. So, fun. Ooh. Yeah. One of the, I think the first card they showed, I think looks like, you know, this could be modern playable. Like yes, the I Animus, think it could be. Which is just a legendary two mana artifact at the beginning of your end step. Exile up to one target legendary creature card from a graveyard with a memory counter on it. And then you can tap until your next turn. Target legendary creature you control becomes a copy of target creature in exile with a memory counter on it. Activate only as a sorcery. That's, I mean, so that's cool. That's, you know. Gristle brand, all that good stuff. Legendary stuff. Attracts We're copying. A whatever. Emrakul. Emrakul. There you go. No, Emrakul doesn't go into graveyards, does she? Well, you can respond with the trigger on the stack, right? Oh, Devin always thinking about how to be good at mm-hmm. magic. Mm-hmm. Devin always looking at the stack. <laughs> I got. I, I want to shout out a card from the Assassin's Creed set that I saw. And I don't. Mm. I mostly posted this as a meme on Twitter, but it's called... Uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Ezio Auditore da Firenze. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, two, mm-hmm. two mana, black and a color is three, two menace. It says assassin spells you cast have four running black, black. Uh, but the more important, which says you may cast a spell for its four running cost. If you dealt combat damage to a player this turn with an assassin or commander. And then it says whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may pay Wooberg. If that player has 10 or less life, when you do that player loses the game. Yeah, I thought that was sick. I love that little like assassinate mode. Yeah, my Twitter post was with this and uh, Leyland of the Guild Pact. <laughs> <laughs> so do with that it's information what you will i don't i don't know what you want to do with that but yeah i mean there's some other interesting cards in here um i even thought that this weird hidden blade card was interesting it's a two two mana uh piece of equipment with equip two it gives plus one plus zero in first strike and has flash and uh you can it's you can also you it, it auto equips but if you attach it to an assassin that creature also gains death touch until end of turn so that seemed like some interesting stuff to me I don't know. There's some there's some cool cards here. The the other thing that's kind of strange about this set, I mean, I don't know a ton about Assassin's Creed for what it's worth. I've played like two thirds of the original Assassin's Creed and then got tired of jumping from building top to building top and just kind of quit. <laughs> you got tired of that? That's the it's literally the best part. That is the game. It just, well, that maybe that maybe I enjoyed it enough. But the the other thing I was going to say was they decided to make because Assassin's Creed has so many historical cre- people in it, historical characters in it, they decided to make cards of real historical people for the first time in a very, very long time, depending on how you interpret older magic canon. And so there's a Leonardo da Vinci card. Three, three mana, three, three, by the way. Swole. Yeah. Yeah, it's a three mana, three, three that has an activated ability that's three generic blue, blue until end of turn thopters, you control have base power and toughness XX where X is the number of cards in your hand. So you can make your thopters into a giant team. And then it also has like a looting ability that lets you do a whole bunch of uh, copying stuff, like some wild copy stuff. And they also made a card of Cleopatra. So I I don't know what other ones are coming, but kind of, kind of interesting. I really, I can't wait to kill someone with Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, but here's here's the thing about this set that's going to be difficult. <laughs> Number one is, if this is modern legal, I wonder if there are any cards that are going to be old cards that fit the theme of Assassin's Creed that are suddenly going to become modern legal that weren't before. We'll have to keep an eye out for that. And then the other thing is, what is the, like, we'll, we'll have to keep an eye out for the, like, three mythics in this set that are good that are impossible to get because they're in a tiny set that nobody wants to open. Just a guess. Oh, you we'll mean, say. like, Nissa Resurgent and Emist? <laughs> Yeah, that kind of thing. Yep. Maybe we won't have this problem with Assassin's Creed as much as we had in Aftermath because it being a straight to modern set, maybe it's a little more powerful and people will be more incentivized to crack it open. Yeah. Yeah, maybe people will just want Ezio for their uh for their commander deck or something. <laughs> the the other thing I wonder is how many cards are in the back because Aftermath I think was only five card packs. Oh god. I think that's what we're looking. They haven't confirmed that yet, but I'm assuming we're looking at exactly the same thing or something very close. I I am absolutely ready for our $10 five card packs of historical figures. <laughs> And figurines. What other historical pick? We, we were joking around that it was like, I got killed by Pope Innocent the <laughs> like, Tenth. <laughs> sick commander deck. <laughs> oh, man, he's running Pope. That's 
that's like is that do you, do the, is the high number the good deck or the low number the good deck? That's ten. My Pope deck is a total seven. It poked. <laughs> You know, my pope deck, my, my pope innocent the innocent the tenth deck is an is an X level power. I got poped. Anyway, all right, Assassin's Creed. Not not too too much there, but we'll have to keep an eye out on it. Next up, the big one that everybody here cared about. Shane, I don't know why. Are you? Are you oh, okay? I mean, I just just leave him out on Horizon C for the end. Okay, fine. So we'll we'll go out of order from the presentation. We can talk about Thunder Junction. Thunder Junction. It's a standard set. Obviously, yeah, it'll be fun. It, yeah, I think it'll be fun. You know, what we can, we know what kind of impact standard sets tend to make on our formats. Although you never quite know exactly what's going to happen. I mean, there is an Oko, Vein Ripper, or uh, Leyline the Guild Pact. All of those things have done things to modern. But yeah, there's there's some good cards here. I thought one of the most interesting things that Shane said in here is uh, in the notes is this idea of committing a crime, which is kind of a it's like a condition you meet. It's not necessarily uh, a trigger or something like that, but it's the idea that a lot of cards in this set give a bonus if you have committed a crime. And what committing a crime is, is using a spell or ability you control to target your opponent or your opponent's stuff. And so there's a lot of things that are going to trigger off of interaction in this set. So I'm 100% going to be looking for things that are cheap payoffs for, for that because, you know, we always want to be messing with people's stuff. Touching their cards without asking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Rude. if I just if I just pick up and just go over and like grab one of their lands, is that committing a crime? I mean, yes, yeah. but a different kind of crime. Yeah. The the thing that I thought was really wild was like the bonus sheet, which I I, I don't know for sure, but I think it might be like the canceled extras, like aftermath style set, and they're just like running it as a bonus sheet where they're putting like one card per pack, and then you know they're not legal in standard, but they're legal in whatever set they're legal in, and like they have like this breaking news treatment for cards that sort of makes sense. Like, oh, I think Mara said they're all crimes, so like yeah, they're crimes. So the one, you know one was like Thoughtseize. Um, there's gonna be a textured foil that uh, the art on that one looks really cool. There is uh, Crime and Punishment, of course, was revealed. They also revealed a new sword, Sword of Wealth and Power, which gives protection from instants and sorceries. And when the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you create a treasure token, EDH. And the next instant or sorcery you cast that turn gets copied. That seems like a decent one. So there's no, this is like, you know, no colors are involved here. There's no like color protection. It's like spell type protection. So that's pretty cool. So this bonus sheet, that sword, is do have did they confirm whether or not that's standard legal? No, it's only legal in the sets they're currently legal in. But I don't know what is the well, sword, sword in the exist. main set or is it in the extra set? I forgot. That's what I don't know. It's a, it, so I'm looking on the goldfish page. It's listed under the vault bonus sheet main set. Oh, but I don't okay. know what that means. You know? Yeah, you never know anymore. But yeah, there's a sword. There is there is an sword. <laughs> there is Blue definitely sword. a sword. I do. I yes, like the, yeah. the swords of all time, as you would say. <laughs> I like the the wanted poster showcase ones, the Oko and the tiny bones. Those look pretty cool. Yeah, they're fun. Absolutely. Dave hates it even more than I, I do. <laughs> I really, I honestly like the full art Oko, the ringleader, because he's being a wizard, but he's riding on a giant. Yeah, elk. A wizard. Oko. That is cool. Yeah. On a big elk. Do we want to talk about the Oko? I think that card's pretty cool. I mean, four mana is a I, lot, I guess, but... Yeah, I mean, it's neat. I'll read it. Two generic, green, blue, for a three loyalty Planeswalker, legendary Planeswalker Oko. His abs are still here. The guy is wearing a cape, some shoulder... What do you call the shoulder things? They're just shoulder protectors. Frills? But no is shirt. that a stole? A stole? Is that a stole? I don't know. He's wearing shoulder protectors. Shoulder pads? we can still see his abs. It is a stole. Okay. And then it says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, Oko, the ringleader, becomes a copy of up to one target creature you control until end of turn, except he has hexproof. Plus one, draw two cards. If you committed a crime this turn, discard a card. Otherwise, discard two cards. Uh, minus one, create a 3-3 three, three green elk creature token. And minus five, for each other non-land permit you control, create a token that's a copy of that permanent. Whoa, that ultimate is... Yeah, that's, that's interesting. pretty good. It's only five, too. So you just go, yeah. you know, plus plus, then ult it, so... Um, I don't know. I kind of like this card. Just, you know, the fact that it, it effectively has four. The one thing I like about these Planeswalkers is kind of what we've learned since, you know, War of the Spark and all these kinds of uh, the static ability Planeswalkers is you have to treat that as a fourth ability, right? It's kind of right. just like that's a that's a free zero that you get every turn. And I don't exactly know what you're pairing this, but like 
some sort of green creature that has haste. So you can like, I'm trying to think in standard, there's um, the questing Axe beast, Ferox. Yeah, questing beast is a good example, but something like you curve, you play that and then you play the Oko after that. And now you have your Oko has haste and hexproof um, where that curve is kind of cool. Like if you're doing stuff with the graveyard, you can discard two cards, uh, minus one, make a three, three. It just seems, it seems kind of cool. I, I like this card. I yep. guess it's the, uh, the, the casting cost that immediately made me go, yes. I don't know, but you know, four mana planeswalkers are starting to pop up a little bit more, especially when they have this much text on them. So I could see it. You know, what card I like from that they previewed from this. Uh, I like the world championship card that was previewed here. Nathan Stoyer's card is in here from last year. It's called duelist of the mind. It is a generic and a blue. It is a star three and it has Flying and Vigilance, and Duelist of the Mind's power is equal to the number of cards you've drawn this turn. Whenever you commit a crime, you may draw a card. If you do discard a card, this ability triggers only once each turn. Obviously, that last sentence is quite a bummer. Mm. Probably a little too good if they didn't have that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just really well, chain well, once each, storm off somewhere. but Once each turn, can't you just also do it on your opponent's turns? Yes, yeah. but it, you don't care as much on your opponent's turn about the power. Yeah, well... Might be might be important to Let's go help with, with defense. Yeah, but I, I so like I wonder if countering a spell is a crime. It must be. If you're interacting with the opponent's spell, or is it only interacting with the opponent's permanent? They didn't mention that. Let me check. I know it's like zones. Like if you interact with their graveyard, that's a crime. So I'm gonna guess interacting with something on the stack would perhaps also be a crime. But there is no content on this yet, so we're gonna have to see. I I'll, I'll email Blake real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Get him on speed dial. Yeah, we're, we're close friends now. Dave, take us to Modern Horizons. Last thing, Modern Horizons 3. So that actually comes out right after Thunder Junction. It comes out in June at some point. One of the first cards that they showed was a new Emrakul and said that colorless is a returning theme that they felt like they weren't going to do in modern at or in uh standard at any point soon but they felt like it's something that modern players would like that they could come back to i mean so it. give me some tron pieces yeah i'm gonna read this card emrakul the world anew it is 12 mana for a 12 12 when you cast this spell gain control of all creatures target player controls it has flying protection from spells and from permanents that were cast this turn so etbs can't get it when Emrakul, the world anew, leaves the battlefield, sacrifice all creatures you control. So you sacrifice all your opponent's creatures if it dies. And then it has madness. Pay six colorless mana. Love it. Does not have flying. Oh, it does have flying. Does not have anything else. Protection I guess what else from you spells <laughs> and from permanents yeah. that were cast. This no game. ley line binding on this one. Somebody was talking in my stream about the, I think, I think, I don't know, maybe Spike brought this up, but it was like cookbook and then you can either have three temples or you just natural Tron. And then you have, yeah. like, you know, this with cookbook, but I don't know. I mean, it seems powerful if you can somehow get consistent madness enablers, but I mean, even for 12, it's not that bad, right? Like it as a Tron no. payoff. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's a card you could play in, you know, uh, the problem is, is it only gets creatures. So, like, if your opponent's playing a lot of creatures and you're playing Tron, you're likely not happy. So it's like, you know, oh yeah, sure, it's like it's a it's a good against a long grindy control matchup. Well, it's like, well then, you know, that's you're not gonna have a lot of creatures at that point, probably. Yeah. So there's a few different random mechanics together in this set. One is uh, energy is going to be in the set. They showed one new energy card. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that but already. <laughs> didn't really have a lot to talk about with it. It's called Scurry of Gremlins. Uh, Scurry of Gremlins enters the battlefield, create two 1-1 one, one red gremlin creature tokens. Then you get an, an amount of energy equal to the number of creatures you control. Then you can pay for energy. Creatures you control get plus 1, plus 0, and gain haste until you end the turn. That is an enchantment that costs two generic and a red and a white. Um doesn't seem that amazing. Energy is weird to me. Yeah. I don't know if that's Energy. really like modern playable. I, and I almost hope that they don't make it modern constructed playable. But okay, Energy's back. Uh, and then another mechanic that's in here or, or a theme that's in here is Flip Walkers. So we did these a long time ago back in Magic Origins as the origins of the Core 5 Gatewatch Walkers, where they had a creature side, and then when certain conditions were met, their spark, spark fired, and they flipped over to the other side. There's an Ajani one in here now that is a 1-2. He's four, ripped. A, uh, a generic and a white. What's that? Look at the backside. Yeah. I said, look at the backside. Yeah. <laughs> you think he's ripped on the front side. Sheesh. 
Yeah. Johnny's my official fur is, daddy. If you look at the art, is that you in the background? Just staring at him? <laughs> hey, boss. Yeah, that's me. Looking, looking up to your up, daddy. Looking up to my fur when daddy. Johnny... <laughs> Uh, Nakato Pariah enters the battlefield, create a 2-1 white cat warrior creature token, so it makes another token. Whenever one or more other cats you control die, you may exile a Johnny, then return him to the battlefield transformed under his owner's control. So I hate that it's a sad story, but you have to die, Stan, in order for a Johnny to flip. Because if that's you in the background, clearly you're the 2-1. You're the I, a loyal bebe, will always do this for my big right. hairy papa. So he flips, in the chat for he flips, he's a three loyalty planeswalker, put a plus one, plus one counter on each cat you control, is for plus two, zero, create a two one white cat warrior creature token, when you do, if you control a red permanent other than a Johnny, he deals damage equal to the number of creatures you control to any target, it's an interesting card, um, and then minus four, each opponent chooses an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker from a num among non-land permanents they control, then sacrifices the rest. That, I believe, is close to a card called Cataclysm from back in the day. It doesn't, it's not exactly the same. Cataclysm hit lands, all right? We're not, you know, we're not going It down. also was everybody. It was everybody. It wasn't, this is just your opponent. It makes them get rid of all their stuff. It's only one-sided. Oh, it's only one-sided. Okay, that's cool. So, but still, a little riff on that. Just imagine for a second, turn one, Witch's Oven, turn two, a Johnny, Witch's Oven, sack the token, flip, here we go. Yeah, that seems wild. Just saying, not bad. And then you get another token right away, because you just make it, you just zero a Johnny when you flip it, and get a 2-1. All right, a couple other things in this set. Allied fetches. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop, which people have been waiting for. They were starting to get expensive. They're not particularly at the moment again, but they're they're definitely more expensive than the, um, the enemy ones at this point. It I mean, fetches are important. Like, yeah. We'll never complain about a meaningful reprint. And we saw that the enemy fetch lands in MH2 were a meaningful reprint. Really drove the price down of all of them. Yeah, so. and they still have not gotten out of, I would yeah, say. they're dirt cheap. Yeah. They're like 15 bucks. They are very accessible to people right now, I think. Uh, there's snow-covered wastes in this set. There's a snow-covered <laughs> wastes here, which is super <laughs> interesting. I don't know what that is or who that's for. Not sure who wanted that one. Somebody apparently wanted it. And then there's a few other cool cards, two of which are reprints. Well, a few. Uh, yeah. So two reprints in the set. Lyalia, the Blade Reforged, which is a commander mm -hmm. card. It's a cube card that I think people are familiar with. Uh, this card is a 2-2 haste for two and a red with whenever Lyalia, the Blade Reforged, attacks, I exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. Whenever one or more cards are put into exile from your library and or your graveyard, put a plus one, plus one counter on Lyalia. This card gets big and draws you cards. Cascade, baby. I know we talked about this in the car. Yeah. <laughs> Lyalia Cascade, here we go. Make a giant Lyalia attack. What? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you exile... Yes, Crash the answer Falls, to your question is yes. You can just footfalls for free? No. Oh, no, no, no. With Lay I thought you were going to ask about Cascade. No, so ca if when you Cascade with Laelia in play, it counts each individual card on the Cascade. Mm -hmm. So if you exile 20 cards off the top of your library, Laelia gets 20 counters. <laughs> how, how do we give her Trample? Um, I got a couple uh, ways. One of them is Monstrous Rage, <laughs> which is a card we were talking no. about earlier. That's a pretty good card. But we need a, we need a, a Trample enabler that plays with Cascade. Oh, does Slanitry go give Trample? It does, right? If it's red? If she's green. If she's green. Which she oh, will be. Well, we have Leyline. Yes, we have Leyline, yeah. yes, yeah. Ley yeah. yes. Well, there you go. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Broke it. Sweet. Nailed it. Okay, so there's that. Uh, another card that's being reprinted that I was interested in, too, or I'm not interested in playing, but I thought it was a cool card that's being reprinted, is Priest of Titania, which is a generic and a green for a 1-1 one -one that says tap to add green for each elf on the battlefield to your mana pool. Uh, this is a long time legacy card, right? Or is it just in Commander at this mm -hmm. point? People play it in Legacy. I don't know if they play it as much anymore with you know the printing of Bowmasters, yeah. but it, it was in Legacy for a while. Is it a common, or is it is it an yeah. uncommon too? Because this is this is an uncommon in this set, but I thought it was a common because it might be a is it might be a popper card. It was a common in Saga. I think popper. I don't know if there's a popper elves deck, but if there was, they would definitely play it. Priest of Titania. Just checking on it real quick. It is. It, I mean, it's common in Commander, yeah. which I think is what makes it proper That's legal enough. as well. It's, it's common in Saga too, or yeah, maybe, maybe it's banned in Commander. Might, or you mean banned in Popper? Or Popper? Yeah, I think yeah. it might be banned in Popper. Oh, okay, that would make sense. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's legal. Popper legal. My mistake. Whoops. All right. Well, 
people didn't need it already. It, it it was kind of a pricey card for what it's worth. It was like a ten dollar card, and then now it's gone down already, of course. But mm-hmm. I I mean, Fury's gone. Maybe elves having a two mana arch druid is what it really needed all along. We do have David Warleader. Yeah, the elf that makes <laughs> lots of smaller elves that plays well with something like That's this. True. So. Can I, be, can I be the bad guy and say two words, Orcish Bowmasters? Yeah. I think that's you being yeah, a good guy, it. Devin. Honestly, reminding us before we spend too much time on Priest of Titania, this card from 25 years ago. Uh, okay. Aaron Forsyth during the panel also said that free spells were a part of what modern is. Just in case anybody had any question about that anymore. <laughs> Wizards Except Fury. it is. And uh, so we have a new cycle of free cards they're trying to make them a little bit debuffed this time. Flare of Cultivation is the example. It's a generic green green for a sorcery that says you may sacrifice a non-token green creature rather than pay the spell's mana cost. And what it does is search your library for up to two basic land cards, reveal those cards, put one onto the battlefield tapped, and the other into your hand, then shuffle. So yeah, I don't think this card is good. No, absolutely not. But maybe the other ones... We'll see. Do we we could try to speculate on what you think? So if they're like if they're maybe utilizing old spell templates as a way to, you know, a means to convert that into a free spell, what like what are you guys thinking? Maybe the other ones, it could be like I don't know, what's like a I don't know, stone rain, but they obviously wouldn't give us a free stone rain. My my guess for the red one is light up the stage. Okay. A, I can a see free that. light up the stage. I would love something that's just like sack a creature to play this for free deal four damage as you'd like divided among any number of creatures playing walkers <laughs> and players <laughs> on a 3-3 three, three double striker like that's my wish it would have flash too right preferably yeah yeah all right yeah i think that's it yeah i really like psychic frog too but we'll talk about it another day <laughs> i love the frog i love the frog i love that warner brothers frog you know hello my honey uh, as we mentioned though Following this, we did get to sit down with Blake and Roy. We talked these, we talked the, basically, we talked this over. Like we uh, talked about Horizons 3, we talked about uh, Universes Beyond, we talked about set design, all that good stuff. So let's just play that interview now. Um, I, I will say, mea culpa, our primary recorder failed on us during this interview, but thankfully, you know, we had our handheld backup going. We did not lose the interview. So it's going to sound not as good as we hoped, but it's totally serviceable. But forgive us of the audio quality issues that we may have here. But yeah, let's roll the tape. Lock the gates. All right. We are here at MagicCon Chicago with Blake Rasmussen and Roy Graham from Wizards of the Coast. Thanks for joining us. Sure thing. Happy to be here. Awesome. <laughs> So uh, we're a modern magic focused podcast, like 80% of what we do is talk about modern, the rest is a little bit of pioneer and sometimes like timeless stuff like that. So mostly like the non-rotating formats, right? So Modern Horizons is going to be the most interesting to us to talk about and to our listeners. I, I think a couple of questions I want to start out with. I thought the spoiler panel was excellent. I'm going to follow up with a couple of questions about the mechanics and stuff like that. But one thing is when you know when you all started thinking about making Modern Horizons three, given how much impact there was from Modern Horizons two, can you give us any, any insight to how the team felt about working on the next project as they embarked on that? What they thought maybe about the impact of Modern Horizons two and how they wanted to calibrate three. Uh, I mean, two is a really hard act to follow. <laughs> yeah. Um, not only did it create a you know a ton of uh, it created new archetypes. It um, brought new staples into the format. It reinvigorated um, strategies that didn't exist before or were um, you know lower tier. And so it's a really hard act to follow. But at the same time, it was so impactful and so um, well liked generally. Of course, it had its critics, but um, we also knew we had to do it again. Yeah. We had to. Um, and so it, I, I think the team has gotten really good at these kinds of sets. And I think you're going to see a lot of that in the, the designs and everything for Modern Horizons 3. And I think, um, you know, one of the other things that excites the team, and I'll let Roy talk about this, is, you know, something we don't get to do in standard sets, which is revisit lore 
for right. and, and things that we couldn't previously do. If you want to yeah. talk about that. Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, we don't want to give, give the bag away just yet, but uh, we, in the, in the preview panel, we showed off a lot of stuff about the Eldrazi. It's mm -hmm. a great example of something that uh, magic players love um, that uh, is on the world building side, like really compelling, really weird, uh, really interesting. Um, but you can't reintroduce the Eldrazi into a, a modern magic story without having pretty serious repercussions right. uh, follow. So uh, with Modern Horizons 3, we can do stuff like that without uh, th throwing the ship off course. Do you feel like that's kind of the way that the, the role storytelling-wise that those sets fill, will probably fill going forward is kind of like finding ways to bring things back as opposed to like reveling in the past a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, the, the Modern Horizons sets are, are such a celebration of like magic's history and, and uh, narrative as well as uh, mechanical history. History, um, with uh, you know modern horizons too, seeing like deck on black blade and stuff yeah. uh, is is the kind of thing that is like that character is never going to be relevant for for modern uh, story audiences. Right. But uh, it, it's uh, getting to include it in something like modern horizons. Yeah, uh, is such a cool opportunity. And I definitely you know I mean I've I've been playing since revised, so like I opened deck on black blade and legends originally. So like for someone like me who's been playing for thirty yikes yeah, like thirty years now. I I guess uh, and for people who are you know in franchise and modern I think it's an awesome way to see like where people came from so that, mm -hmm. that's that's exciting is it hard for you guys to balance something that feels like that's a lot of pieces that come together that or do you just kind of lean into it and go there doesn't have to be continuity no I mean I think they're also on one hand uh, we do lean into it we don't we it, there doesn't have to be continuity um, but it also can't it can't just feel like everything right, right. it can't be like ev it's it's all things from magic's history period right. uh, we so picking like there's the Eldrazi picking uh, you know like doing uh, energy and, and yeah. focusing on the mechanics that um, I think on the panel Aaron said uh, there needs to be like a critical mass of these mechanics to, to have them work and, and function in a set right. uh, that helps narrow it down in, in the world building sense as well um, and it, it gives the sets a little more focus when the um, canvas is everything that you everything in magic, magic's history right? So it sounds like you have to, you know, you want to balance picking and choosing interesting things, both like, you know, thematically and mechanically, but also have it fold into, I imagine, what's happening in modern right now. Like, but like, how do you, how do you think that you make those decisions where, you know, are you looking at the set as it exists right now and changes that you would like to see or just say, hey, this set is working in these ways right now and we can add these things and see what happens. So that's kind of like, I think, the thing that at least players like ourselves are probably looking at, like, hey, how do they actually think about designing these Horizon sets? Yeah, one of the unique things that we do for the, the Horizon sets and have done for each of them is actually bring in um, pro players and successful modern players on contract basis to, to come and test and work on the set. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of them who worked on Modern Horizon Horizons 2 have talked about their experiences afterwards. We did the same thing for Modern Horizons 3. So these are people who are playing the format day in and day out. Um, obviously, we have people in-house who pay close attention. We have people who are assigned to modern and that sort of thing. But, you know, it doesn't, nothing beats bringing in someone who's living and breathing that format and, and the ebbs and flows constantly. Um, but one of the focuses and goals of the Modern Horizon sets, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, is taking those archetypes that are like tier two and, and elevating them a little bit tier three um, and finding ways to to make them potentially tier one you know whether whether they get there or not um, depends a lot on metagames but giving players the tools to at least have that chance um, so I'll, I'll give a little spoiler alert that wasn't originally planned, but there may be a Merfolk card or two in this set. And there wasn't Modern Horizons 2 that have yeah. that added for sure. Yeah, and, and we've seen that we, we saw, um, you know, and that was a good example of it's a, it was a lower tier archetype, got a little bit of help. It's gotten some help recently from some standard sets as well, and it's become... It, 
it won an event not too long ago. It, it occasionally shows up here and there, and, and um, if the metagame's right, it can make a splash, pun intended. Um, <laughs> and um, But that's a, a lot of the meat of what they're looking to do, is yes, to create powerful resonance spells that can fit in multiple archetypes, but also to just give tools for people who want to play those kinds of decks. Um, you know, Eldrazi isn't a huge archetype Type right now, but we know people are fans of it from when it was. Right. And so it's just about giving them extra tools and not necessarily dictating where the metagame goes because that's not really possible to predict or to push, but about supplying p- players with the pieces they need to possibly put something together in an archetype they may already love. Yeah, that's awesome. So, colorless mana, energy, at first I feel like kind of not quite chocolate and peanut butter yet I guess at first glance <laughs> so is there any 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 kind of um, any other hints you can give us to maybe how some of these pieces kind of work together or, or how the big picture of the set is going to roll out no <laughs> uh, what, what I will say is that um the Horizon sets have always been really, really fun draft art, um, draft formats, yeah, sure. and um, the team that that's always a focus. Like, yes, the cards that end up in modern and help shape the modern format are sort of the top line of the set, but right up there, one B in terms of goals is making a really cool draft format because you can do things that you can't do other places, and you can make really powerful archetypes. Um, and you know, I, I still remember uh, it wasn't a horizon set but the first modern master set like that dna for the draft environment runs all through yeah. um the horizons line and so i i can say that um it does all fit together yeah. um exactly how you'll have to see that's yeah. awesome world building question Again, about Modern Horizons, though, I imagine with standard sets, the world building team has very specific goals that are about telling a story that goes through multiple sets over many years in some cases. What are some of the world building goals or challenges that you have for sets like Modern Horizons or other supplement products that aren't in the standard cycle? Um, I think it's a, it's a delicate dance uh, because we were talking about deck on Blackblade earlier. Um, uh, it's a it's a dance between uh, deep cuts that are, are gonna you know be great for for like longtime fans to see and, and exciting and um, uh, things that and, and not you know burying uh, players in especially newer players in uh, like nostalgic references that have, have no meaning in the kind of modern like uh, magic lore and, and story environment. Um, I think Modern Horizons has a little bit less. Um, coordination and, and responsibility to like a larger arc for instance but uh, they're also a, a really great place to um, touch on characters that we know are going to be important to magic uh, in the future and and that are like characters that we care about and that our players care about uh, but don't have a place in in this story arc right this minute right so like a Johnny uh, we last saw him dipping out uh, after after the Phyrexian invasion having been healed but like really deeply uh, traumatized by the events of the invasion uh, he killed a lot of people yeah exactly. <laughs> as a Phyrexian um, so uh, you know I think obviously everyone knows that Johnny is, is an important character to magic and he's gonna be back but um, we there's there's been there's a lot going on with with Kellen's arc with the Omen Path stories happening right now, uh, and we're probably not going to see a Johnny for a little bit. Uh, so this was a good place to touch back and, and just remind people that like no we we still care about this character. Remember remember your favorite giant cat man. Mm-hmm. He's still kicking. <laughs> He's still around. His his mode cast Cataclysm right is that the card that that the minus four at the end is something very close to Cataclysm from oh, I got to remember the card it's the one, it's like it's like pick a, an artifact pick a creature pick a land uh, we we don't have to hover on it but it was funny I think that his ultimate is the old card Cataclysm from Stronghold or I think that's the set that it was in but given that's a cat I was like, it, 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 Cataclysm that's pretty funny I'm I'm trying to look at the card right now. Um, because there's also a um, oh god, there was another card, another white 
I think it was five mana a few years back that were kind of like Cataclysm, yeah, it's like but didn't affect the lands. Like Arrogant something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was a cool that was a Gideon flavored card. Yep. So um, similar idea. It's it's a very yeah. white ability, and you know certainly worthy of an ultimate yeah. off a of planeswalker. I was like a plus pawn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's how they came up with it. I don't actually know for that's sure. Funny. I would not put it past. I wouldn't. <laughs> I would not either. Yeah. So I, I'm imagining that you you all maybe didn't reveal too much about who was on the team, or maybe just because we're saving it for preview season. Can you, like Aaron had mentioned that he was the lead designer of two. Can you tell us who the who was working on the... Oh, the Aaron team? was the lead designer for three. Oh, three as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I maybe don't I missed that in the, remember yeah. anyone off the top of my head. I think Emily Tang was the world building. Designer. Okay. Cool. So to go back to story for a minute, one thing that we wanted to ask you about was just... You know, you started to touch on it a little bit with the um, doing story for MH3, but in the in a world where now there's a lot of external IP, I'm curious about a little bit about what that process is for you all. The story, you know, world building story in that external IP world. Do you have to develop a cohesive story that fits within the set? Like, what what is that like with somebody else's character? Sure. I mean, I think I think it's an ongoing conversation, right? Um, uh, right now, the universes beyond and the um, like magic IP teams um, are uh, fairly siloed because uh, telling uh, you know a lot of the stories that we want to touch on for universes beyond are already they, they don't need creating right? right it's like the it's like how do we package them all right right and which which moments do we choose right, right. Um, which are are things that um, I'm mostly more concerned with uh, what you know is happening in the in magic and with these characters and these settings and everything um, uh, but I think that there's like there's room in the future for for uh, there to be more storytelling via universes beyond I'm, I'm, there, I'm not saying that there are any plans yeah for that but sure. uh, I can definitely uh, see like an exciting world uh, where you know we use the opportunity to um, tell stories in, in a different IP uh, outside of just cards. Cool. You know, one thing I thought was interesting was the you know the selective inclusion of what was like what twenty of the cards were reprints from existing You're about Assassin's Creed. Yeah, yeah Assassin's yeah. Creed. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, for Assassin's Creed of the hundred cards, twenty were kind of previously printed, but they made thematic sense mm-hmm. to be included. How do you, in terms of designing the the new cards? You know, is it, what's the thought process, I guess, or as close as you can get to, to uh, summarizing it in terms of, like, how do you design cards that are, you know, intended to be modern legal, legacy legal, things like that, um, but also have cohesion in themselves as, like, a maybe, you know, standalone product? So one of the things that Universes Beyond products are just excellent for are top-down design. And, um, you know, Mark's talked about that a lot. Aaron's talked about it. Um, basically, at every point in design, we've talked about how when you really nail a top-down design, it resonates. And that goes for whether it's Magic or, or Universes Beyond. Um, and Universes Beyond gives the opportunity to have those moments that's, that are just like... Their, their chuckle moments or their moments where you you recognize a thing which is just really powerful with a card and so um, they they try to do that and and make it resonant because otherwise why are you <clears throat> building cards of that world yeah um, and, and and so to make it resonant is core to universes beyond and so that's why you know, it wasn't the most powerful card, but having Haystack be the, the yeah. card we ended on for it was great. It was great. It was it was, it was played the first Assassin's Creed, but I still got it. But that's all you need. Yeah. You hide in Haystack. You, you phase out, and it just it's just such an oh, I, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't that be what it is? Um, and there's just so many of those. Um, and you know, I am someone who's played um, nearly every Assassin's Creed game, and I just I have that with almost every card I look at, I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, I remember that. Um, yeah. uh, Magic is so good at mechanical storytelling, yes. right? Uh, it's, and, uh, you know, I, my mind goes to the, like, 40K decks. I think mm-hmm. they were really great at that also. The, the like, Eisenhorn card that creates um, uh, Ch- Cherub- Cherubel token, who is the his, like, antagonist in the Inquisitor trilogy and, yeah. and whatever. And th- th- there's, there's just so much... Um, opportunity uh, in Universes Beyond to, to do that. 
and and it's and it's all, there's also these great aha moments getting back to the question about reprints of when you find the perfect magic card that already exists you know we talked about this on the um fallout debut pure steel paladin was just like perfect open the vaults like oh my god right. um you just see these things and, and they immediately connect with you. Um, and, you know, things like Cover of Darkness, which, yes, of course, Assassins Attack under Cover of Darkness. Sword of Feast and Famine, of course, they have swords. Um, you know, Temporal Trespass, that one is a fantastic little package for me because it ties together the, the flavor text and the art and the, the name and the effect. And it, it just all really resonates with me. And I, and I think that's part of the power of Universes Beyond is that people already come in with that background knowledge um, and, and love of those things. I guess one one quick question that I had just as a close out, just while we're talking about Universes Beyond, is one thing I've always been curious about is, um, is, so working together with another IP, when you're designing a magic card, is there collaboration there from that side that helps kind of validate, yeah, that does feel like that character to us as well, or like, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. We work really closely um, with all of our partners at every stage, from concepting to designing to art all the way up through marketing um and a lot of the time i I, i'm saying a lot of the time but it might be every time um we always end up working with someone on the other side who's a fan of magic oh that's awesome and so they end up sharing their insights and and they get it to um you know one of the fallout panelists uh the the panel that's going on right now um from uh, Bethesda, huge Magic fan. He and I shared our, we both started around the same time, like right before Alliances, after Ice Age. And um, we find that at almost like every other game company, especially, there, there's a fan. And so, um, yeah, they they not only are have been wonderful to work with, um, but oftentimes are eager to, to work with us on. I mean, it's interesting because it's sort of, it's almost like a proof of concept for you guys on moving into universes beyond in the first place, right? Is because so many tendrils of magic have been behind the scenes with people mm-hmm. who make games for so long. Yeah. It's great to hear that like you're receiving that positive feedback when you're working on the projects as well. It's cool. Yeah, it's it, magic's in, I mean, we've been around for 30 years and magic as a game is so influential to, um, not only other games, but game designers especially. And Seattle's kind of a hotbed of game studios. And so um, we did this pre-pandemic. We we kind of stopped, obviously, because of the pandemic. But we used to have a program where we would um, just kind of give draft product to other game studios because they would have draft nights and stuff. Like, we'd go up to Microsoft and we'd draft with them. And, um, you know, we went to Riot and played with them and we'd have all those kind of things. So um, the the game community, um, the people who work on games of all kinds, whether it's tabletop, video games, whatever, um, we all play each other's stuff. And so getting to work with each other is, is really cool. So all of the partnerships have been um, great in that respect. And um, yeah, we work with them from tip to tail. No, thanks a ton. Yeah, really appreciate time. the time. Yeah, it was good to good to meet both of you and appreciate yeah. your time and I'm sure the listeners will as well. So thanks again. Right Absolutely. on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks guys. Thank you. Okay, perfect. I loved it. Love that interview. Good good work, Dave. Um, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks. Thanks again. Blake and Roy, I know you listened to the dive down. Thanks so much for your time. Uh you know, very, very informative, very cool. Uh got some good insight there. Also I want to say quick thanks to Jeff and Liz for uh, helping us oh, set yes. that up so yes awesome awesome media handlers for sure i felt i felt in good hands for sure all right let's get out of here we'll get into the dive down segment and Devin and stan will be walking us through their experiences with rakdos vamps so stay with us Black Red Vampires, the talk of the town, interview with the vampire, my favorite movie. No. Devin, you don't see the light of day. Maybe you are a, a night walker, too. Am I the vampire? Are you interviewing me? Is that, what the, is that what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your new, your new flick. Show, roll, the, roll, the, roll the clip.
Yeah, we have a trailer, official official dive down trailer. So this isn't like really the first time we've seen a vampire duck and pioneer. Once upon a time, there was mono black vampires in the first run of Smuggler's Copter. Um, it was sort of adjacent to mono black aggro, and there was mm. like a slighter, slightly vampiric build. And, and I think, as we mentioned, people have tried to make Soren good. Um, I'm trying to double check the name of this exact Soren. It's S- Soren Imperious Bloodlord. Can you remind me, what what's the other creature people used to play with Soren? So there's been a couple over the years. The The first initial one was Champion of Dusk. That was the 4-4 that ETB'd. You draw X, lose X, where X is the number of vampires. And then there's been various stints over the past, like, maybe two years with, like, uh, Lord Xander, which was the seven banded Grixis one that like ETB, they sack all their half of their stuff or whatever. And then when it attacked, they discard half their hand or something like that. And then there was Galton Maverin, which was the 12 12 trample. Um, but it turns out that, you know, the more successful versions of Soren over the past have just been not, not small ball stuff because Champion's still a five drop, but like not going all the way up to seven and, and plus mana. It's just played the good five or six drop that you can cast some of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're doing here. And and I think like this list of cards that we've played with Soren before highlights the fact that this is sort of a black mid-range style splinter twin-esque enabler where we're always on the lookout for really good high C or high-ish CMC vampires that we can cheat into play as early as turn three for value, preferably. How does this particular Soren work with, with Vein Ripper? So the Vein Ripper card, it's a six mana creature, three black, black, black. It's a flying six, five. It has ward sack a creature, which means if opponents are trying to interact with the Vein Ripper, they have to sacrifice a creature to get past its ward ability. And then it has this additional line of text. Whenever a creature dies, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So that triggers on creatures you control as well as creatures opponents control. In addition to this two card combo, we are also kind of running like the shell of a black red mid range deck. You do have thought season fatal push for your early games. You have some pretty effective two drops, including blood tithe harvester and smugglers copter. And then a three, if you don't have the Soren um, or something to combo with it, you also have fable of the mirror breaker and Preacher of the Schism for basically ways to either dig to your combo pieces or just have like really effective permanence that can sort of snowball on their own. And that was kind of the other thing too. So, you know, we've talked about Vein Ripper being the new vampire centerpiece around this deck, but Preacher of the Schism is still a relatively new card. It was only two sets ago. And that's another vampire that's seen a ton of play in standard. Hasn't really translated that well to Pioneer yet. Like the Rakdos mid-range decks are still playing Trespasser and Fable at three. They're not interested in in uh, Preacher. But because we have the vampire sub-theme, it does make a lot of sense to play that over something like Trespasser. Um, one thing to, to note here is we, you know, we had talked about how Rakdos mid was 14% of the metagame and this deck was 4%. I mean, you could honestly, it, these decks are relatively close enough to each other. There is like that vampire sub theme, but they do are, they are kind of trying to accomplish the same thing where it's like blood side thoughts, these fatal push fable, that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, if, if you combine the two Rakdos was the most played deck of the PT technically. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting point. There, there's a couple little tiny tech changes between the two. Like, this deck is actually running slightly less removal than the other one, than the yeah. than the normal Rakdos mid. And it's also running, at least Seth, Seth's list was running, two additional main deck duress, which was kind of interesting. So you had six discard spells in here. Bear in mind, like, some of the removal is baked into Soren. True. Yeah, you know, true. He, he has this ability, plus one, you may sack a vampire when you do it he deals three damage to any target and you gain three life. Yeah, that's true. Um, and Preacher of the Schism, l- l- I want to read this card really quick. Two and a black for a 2-4 vampire cleric with death touch. When he attacks the player with the most life or tied for the most life, you create a 1-1 one, one white vampire creature token with lifelink. When he attacks while you have the most life or are tied for the most life, you draw a card and you lose one life. So if you're behind he's drawing you cards if you're ahead or at parody he's making bodies 
which I think is pretty cool. And that token trigger was especially useful with Soren's plus one lightning helix. And I, I thought that was one of the, the neat ways to kind of maximize Soren, even if you don't have Vein Ripper, is using Preacher to just like make lightning helix fodder. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing that, uh, you know, we, we Dave was mentioning the difference that, or Seth was playing two man deck to rest. The, I think Seth might have been the only person who had deviated from the more commonly uh, CFB list, which the only difference was from Seth's list. Seth had one extra duress and one shielded in the main where most of the other players had two additional Dusk Legion Zealots, bringing it up to four copies. And Soren does get a little bit better when you have the full play set of Zelda because you have more, you know, random stuff to sacrifice to it. So let's talk a little bit more detail about how this is actually different from the red black mid range deck that's sort of been a staple of the Pioneer Rata game for maybe years now. The addition of the vampire cards, I think, create a much more linear, aggressive creature focused strategy than the red black mid-range deck which i think is a little bit more about having flexible cards that do different things that you can attack your opponent from a number of different angles from so while we are playing generically good mid-range cards copter fable backed up by thoughtseize and fatal push the creature suite here is really constructed to synergize as much as possible with with soren as sort of being the backbone i think of the most powerful thing that this deck can do which is just cheat out six five flyers on turn three that are hard to interact with because of everything else you're playing to keep them at bay yeah another thing the you know specifically that the vampire package gives you and this was highlighted in the preview article they did for when they you know announced the metagame and they were talking about the different decks um they had kind of reached out and interviewed a couple of the channel fireball people who were playing this vampires deck and a big reason why they were playing it over something like traditional Rakdos was the addition of cavernous souls because they you know anticipated that blue white control was going to be one of the most played decks and getting to play a deck that is all the same creature type and utilize cavernous souls is really important against those control decks it, it cavern of souls isn't the only thing that i think makes this good against control and maybe that's really the the story behind why it was such an interesting call for the weekend and perhaps the best call possible for this weekend, it's blue way control matchup was eye popping 67% win rate between vampires and Azorius. And I think the ability on the tin of Soren into Vein Ripper, that's probably a part of that. Vein Ripper's ward ability makes it really difficult for the blue white decks to actually interact with Vein Ripper one to one, but the addition of things like Cavern of Souls, having Smuggler's Copter up to just like have a sticky threat that is harder to interact with as well. I, I think all of this sort of comes together to really target Blue Eye Control as as I think maybe they too perceived would be the most or one of the most popular decks in the room. Yeah, one of the other things that Reed Duke mentioned on stage about this matchup during the finals was. Um, the fact that, yes, it's very, very hard for Blue-White to come up with a creature to be able to target Vein Ripper, but even if they Wrath Vein Ripper away, if you have any kind of a board, uh, and it's not, you know, they're not farewelling you, so they're not exiling, if you if they're killing your board with, like, a Supreme Verge or something, they have to take, like, eight damage to do it, because, you know, you'll generally have a couple of, you know, a few Vampires and Vein Ripper, and then they take two per body on your side. And so it, it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation for Blue White, where it's like even if you kill their my even if you kill a vampire deck stuff, you're still taking that damage. I think if we look at vampires versus the broader metagame, you have to also consider the fact that the is it Phoenix matchup noticeably weaker, and perhaps that's not surprising because Phoenix is this anti creature deck with a lot of one for one removal that is within. Uh, vampire's range, including Vein Ripper. He has five toughness when he enters, so he's still within reach of Lightning Axe. And thanks to things like Picklock Prankster or even Ledger Shredder, and even Phoenix for that matter, like you actually have material that you can sacrifice to the Vein Ripper ward ability without actually feeling like you're going down on cards. You're going to make up, make them up uh, with Treasure Cruises anyway, or Picklock Prankster is probably already drawn you you know, a card on its own when you adventured it. 
Yeah, that definitely that does seem like a tough matchup. And like, I guess the the Phoenix is too the the Phoenix matchup per se. There's not a ton of good targets for the Soren Lightning Helix. Like by the time you're playing Soren Shredder is probably already a two four, so you're not killing that. You don't really want to kill a Phoenix with it because it's going to come back the next turn. So yeah, I, I could definitely see that matchup being quite a bit worse when you're cutting stuff like Shieldred and some of kind of like in Graveyard Trespasser, that's like a huge part of the matchup from the Rakdos midrange side of things. So when you swap those cards for the Vampire package, I, I definitely could see that being a lot worse. One of the other things that I thought was pretty interesting was that it had a 75% win rate against Lotus Combo, which makes me wonder whether Team CFB was also doing a little bit of tournament calculus assuming that Lotus Combo is going to eat up all the Phoenix decks, because Phoenix is sure to be quite popular too, and then they have the deck that's good against both Blue-White Control, which is just everywhere, as well as the deck that beats on the other top most popular deck in the format, is it Phoenix? And maybe Vampires isn't good enough to attack everyone in the metagame, but like having this strategic way to kind of get around the top most popular decks, or, or the the formats that can actually deal with the top most popular decks gives them a way to, I don't know, maybe cut their losses even against their, their worst matchups. Yeah. That, that win rate against Lotus field kind of surprises me. Cause when I, I don't know if say if you have the same experience, Dan, but when I played this deck last night, I went three and two and my two losses were both to Lotus field. Um, and like you do have a lot of bad cards game one, you have the fatal pushes, the bitter triumphs. Those aren't very good. It seems like you can't really clock them fast enough unless you draw the twin, which is like if you have Soren Ripper, maybe you can get them dead on turn four. But like if they're on the play, they can probably kill you on their turn four, especially since you're only meaningful interaction and main deck is Thoughtseize. So I don't know that that matchup seems maybe a little tougher than that win rate would uh, would 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 show. Yeah, perhaps. Post board, maybe it gets easier, too, because you yeah. have extra duresses there. You have Liliana and you have Damping Sphere. Well, I guess now that now that I'm, I'm mentioning it, so the, the Pro Tour was open deck list. And I wonder if open deck list, it definitely has to help a matchup like that, where if you know that you're playing against Lotus and you have to mulligan aggressively to Soren plus Vein Ripper, maybe that, you know, that that can definitely help things. Yeah. Or a couple of thoughtsies. Yeah. So. Devin, you and I played this deck. Mm -hmm. You you got a 3-2, which means you did better than me. <laughs> I, I found it quite difficult. And maybe that's lack of experience playing Rakdos in general. Maybe it's already people beginning to respond to it a little bit. I did face Blue-Eye Control twice in my league, and I only beat them once. Um, since they're now running random creatures, Regal Caracol was one of them. Oh, boy. <laughs> so the cat package. Against me. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to hear more about your league and, and maybe how you think it stacks up against Red Black and, and maybe what else you learned while playing with it. So as I said, my two losses were both the Lotus Field. Um, I can't remember if I won or lost the die rolls. I think I might have split. Um, but yeah, just like that, again, that matchup seemed a little tough where I just, you know, I didn't know what I was playing against. Maybe kept a hand with a fatal push or two that ended up getting dead. Uh, I did beat Blue White. I beat the Mirror and I also beat Amalia. Those are my three wins. Um, the mirror match was kind of weird. Like we both did our thing. Well, actually, we both didn't do our thing. But I, I think game one, I had Soren Vein Ripper, my opponent played Fable, and like you know, it, the game was kind of over there. Just you know, if you if you have one player has the combo, the other doesn't. It seems pretty lopsided. Um, the Amalia matchup felt decent. I mean, you have you know the fatal pushes. The, the the typical Rakdos fair against Amalia. And then also like the Vein Ripper stuff is pretty good against them just because they gain a lot of incidental life and turning your removal spells into drain twos was pretty massive against them. Where like if you if you had Sora and Vein Ripper, you would untap and say like harvester a guy, drain for four, fatal push a guy, drain for two, and just kind of chip shot them out. So that was pretty decent. And then when I played against Blue White Control, that exact situation happened where I just thought to use their counter spell, played Sora and Vein Ripper, and then, you know, like I thought you know, they just they couldn't they didn't have a wrath. They couldn't Emperor it, they couldn't march it. So that was uh, that was my experience against Blue White, but I like the deck a lot. I I felt pretty impressed by it. I um yeah, like I said, I played against Blue White and lost because they started playing Caracal's post board, and I wasn't able to get around their eight Dovin's vetoes seemingly and and no more lies. Um, but I did play against one Blue White control player where I I did do the thing where I soar in them on game one and stole the game really fast. 
game two, I played a little grindier matchup with my extra duresses and my Litlianas, and that seemed to do the, de- the, the deed as well. I like Deadly Dispute as well against Blue White to, to answer their Teferis, um, which feels like one of the ways that they can actually sort of eventually get ahead of you and start to bury you in cards and, and get to their um, to their Wraths, especially. I did lose to a, a couple strange decks, including um, Quintorius Combo was was difficult because they just they really splinter twin you know we talk about this being a splinter twin deck but you don't actually want on the spot you still have to swing a few times with with your fan ripper and hopefully other things um whereas quint combo like they'll get to four sometimes and then they'll discover and and it's over um as well as racksack like racksack out grinded me very hard and i could never really I, i don't know like deal with the fact that they're padding their life total with with the cat combo while also finding ways to like pick apart my hand slowly but surely or or deal with my creatures that i'm trying to to resolve so maybe it was just one match that i didn't know how to pilot correctly but um yeah i i I had a harder league but i still won a game every match so I, i i could see that like the deck had explosive potential especially really powerful game ones but maybe people were beginning to already anticipate his popularity and, and come up with solutions that might answer it either post board or w- with their deck selection. Yeah, I mean, it's it. What was very surprising to me about the league, at least the games that I played, was you know we had kind of talked about Soren plus big vampire has been a thing for a while in Pioneer, and people have tried with various different you know big big idiots or what have you, and it kind of felt like this was the first big thing to put in off of Soren that felt like it was good against every single matchup, right? We've mentioned that it's amazing against the other aggressive decks because it turns your removals into drain twos. It's amazing against people who are not playing creatures because they can't kill it and they can't target it. So it doesn't really feel like it misses a lot in terms of, you know, um, dying to removal or, or things like that. And unlike a lot of the previous big things that people have tried to put in off Soren. So, I mean, I, honestly, I think this deck is here to stay. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's a Rakdos deck. It's relatively hard to hate out. You know, there's, you can play maybe more, some more creature removal, but depending on how many creatures you have, that may or may not kill Vayne Ripper. So um, I think, I think this deck is here to stay. It's, I think it's real. It's, yeah. I agree that the deck demonstrated a really high ceiling. I do also think that this is not a, uh, a scary deck for me because i think the format actually has a lot of tools to answer creature combo we saw that with amalia i think we're going to see that here we've seen it even with like the quintorius combo like in a, in its own way sort of a creature combo that you can interact with and and uh, surprise them with just like a random lava spike or whatever but i i don't know that this is going to be the new tier one menace but maybe this is just like a better way to play Rakdos than just a value-based two-for-one mid-range plan. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I think, you know, depending on what the format looks like, obviously we have a couple of months before the next RSQ season. But, you know, if uh, if the format is anything like it is right now, I will definitely have this on my list of decks to uh, think about. Although I have to spend a lot of money on those Vanderbers and those Sorens now, so... Dave, Shane, any questions about this deck after seeing it played in the finals a little bit? I don't know if either of you had a chance to play with or against it since no. The MC. I mean, it, it looked it looked like a pioneer powered mid range deck to me, which is like like you said, it doesn't look scary. It doesn't look like something that is broken. It just looks like a powerful strategy that has you know gets to use a, a very you know a six mana card, a six mana creature to uh, to good effect. So totally agree. Looked fully yeah, that legit. Was, that was one last note that I wanted to mention, and I don't know if this came up for you, Stan, but I actually hard cast Vayne Ripper like two or three times, and mm-hmm. which seemed pretty easier with Fable, right? You yes. just you have Fable to ramp it out. So you know that well, that was something that came up for me a couple times. Yeah, it, Vayne Ripper is also a great copy target for yes. for the reflection. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Usually that that means you've won that you have in fact Splinter Twinned. Yeah, that is literally Splinter Twin. That's that's you know what I mean, kiki cheeky. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they in the final, they were counting up a time where they were about to copy with, with the Fable of the Mirror Breaker token with the Reflection of Kihijiki. 
and I think that Reed was saying that he thought it was going to be like 16 damage because of everything that was going on and all the triggers and then getting triggers off of the Vein Ripper dying and all these like just kind of all, all over the place stuff. It was like attack with two for eight in the air, get a bunch of drain tokens, da 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 drain triggers. Cool. I think that puts this episode probably easily over two hours, maybe right around two hours after we drop that interview in. So we should probably skedaddle. I think that's right. Good app. Yeah, my cat is screaming, so I have to feed him before he wakes wakes everyone in the house. It's me, Andy. All right, that wraps up this week's show. I want food. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episode as soon as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. If you'd like to submit a question to our podcast or just reach out in general, you can tweet us at the dive down, all one word, or email the dive down at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support the show, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the dive down. You can also support us by wearing cool swag. Check out our store at the dive down.com slash store and join the nation with our official state sponsored uniforms. Head over to heavyplay.com to get some incredible deck and dice boxes and play mats featuring their equip mag system. If you use promo code the dive down 2024, you'll get 10% off your first order at Heavy Play. And shout out to Mana Traders for sponsoring the dive down. Depending on when you listen to it, whether it's February or March, the code might be different already. So check out the show notes to this episode to make sure you have the most up to date code for mana traders as always special thanks to the bands nowhere and space blood for letting us use their music and until next week get out there and suck your blood love that joker